Thanks for sharing your time tonight. Um, and that, if you don't know, that was Elise Rodewald, and she is the reason um, why I'm here, why this building is here, why so many of these amazing pieces of SFA Gardens are here. So she's been hard at work here, I think, for 20 years almost, maybe 20, including volunteering. Um, and so um, she's been a great mentor and gotten to learn a lot from her. So yeah, I get to, I have two sons. I have a, an 11 and an eight year old and I've been doing outdoor education with them since they were, you know, able to kind of not even walk, but put dirt in their mouths. So um, I've, I've also started, my background in outdoor education starts as a sixth grader, actually getting to do outdoor school as, um, as an Oregon student, all of the sixth graders get to go for an overnight week-long camp and learn about science in the field, um, in the woods or at the, at the, co at the Oregon coast. Um, and then later in high school, I went back and I was a counselor for two years in a row with this program. That really helped shape, um, it really helped inform my values of how important outdoor education is and why it's so important for our young citizens to be, to encounter that. Um, so let's dive in. So here at SFA Gardens, um, the roots of, of outdoor ed started with Dr. Sowards and Dr. Cheryl Boyette and Elise Rodewald, who put together um, Bugs, Bees, Butterflies, and Blossoms, which started out as um, field trips that uh, area school children could come and visit and do hands-on science lessons about bugs, bees, butterflies, and blossoms. This has grown over the years to, at this point, we see hundreds and hundreds of school kids all within one week. Um, they come from all over, not just from Nacogdoches, and they're really special programs. Uh, Nacogdoches Naturally has been another really special program. We partner with the Boys and Girls Club, and we do an after-school weekly program. So we, um, we get to pick up kids from Boys and Girls Club and bring them here. We learn together about science, outdoor skills, gardening, nutrition, um, and then we take them back to Boys and Girls Club. So that's a big part of my job that I, I love, not only learning with these kiddos every week, but I also get to um, have a lot of fun with college students and Mallory, I'm waving at Mallory in the back, that's one of our after school counselors. So every year I get to work with a team of about eight college students that are learning right alongside um, the kiddos, right alongside myself. It's a really exciting um, program, it's really rich, full of learning. We'll do things like um, in ranging from how to set up a tent, you know, there's a lot of even college students who this is a new experience for them, um, to how to start a garden. What exactly does vitamin C do for you? So we got to eat our own homegrown kiwis here at SFA Gardens the week before last, and we got to talk about how rich those are in vitamin C and how those can keep our immune systems healthy. Um, we, Elise and I, and, and wonderful volunteers do weekly, well, not weekly, depends on the season. We do regular field trips where we learn um, STEM and teaks based uh, different science lessons here. So school children will come from all over and do those. And we do piney wood summer camps. And those, I think you got to hear about those and maybe you'll try it out next year. Um, we have anywhere from four to six year olds have a little kid camp here where we dive in. Every day we learn about a different animal. We have a really fun snack. There's music, there's hiking, there's adventure. Um, the kids have a blast. They want to come back for more. So when they're seven to eight years old, or sorry, seven to 11 years old, they get to go and explore the SFA experimental forest where we'll have lots of big adventures. Every year is a new theme and they'll have a new um, different aspect to learn about um, really ranges. And then once they graduate from those camps, we have a teen program and we go, we'll go camping with those guys and actually take them on um, a three-day camping trip and a 10-mile canoe trip. So we really, we stay busy and we have a lot of fun. Um, there's also, I just wanted to mention in our community, there is actually an outdoor education um, position and that's at the middle school at Mike Moses and McMichael. Do they both have? Okay. Well, they're going to merge anyways, so, um, but that's my husband, Mike Moore, so we get to um, really rock outdoor education here in Nacogdoches. He gets to hang out with uh, seven periods of outdoor ed kiddos every day, and he stays busy. Then we have NAC Gardens. That's a, a, a sort of a volunteer-run network of school gardens at almost every single school at this point in Nacogdoches. There's a volunteer-run school garden. Um, there's also community gardens involved, which is really exciting. I think 
um, Bill Forbes is here with the Golden Gardens. Um, and we have uh, Brown Family Health Center, I think Don helps with that. And we have um, a couple others. So we stay really busy in Nacogdoches with our gardens. And I always just, I always want to use the opportunity to say we welcome volunteers and extra support. And I'll talk more about that later. So, um, so yeah. Our mission here at SFA Gardens is to provide an aesthetic and educational environment for visitors, serve as a living laboratory for SFA students and faculty, promote the conservation and use of native plants, and promote plant diversity in the landscape. And annually, we reach over 12,000 learners a year. A lot of that is through our field trip programming, which is no small feat for, for the team, for the size of the team that we are. So. So we love outdoor education for so many reasons. Um, I'm gonna share a story about Alexa in the picture there in just a minute, but just to kind of explore some of those reasons briefly, we are big believers in skill and project-based learning. So our classroom experience has a lot of sitting, a lot of listening, a lot of writing, not a lot of moving and doing. So when we can combine our learning with, um, with that kinesthetic learning, with, with movement, with engaging, um, peer teaching, you know, when we can get kids to teach other kids and engage and problem solve together. These are real life skills, something that is definitely, um, you know, we need to be teaching these real life skills from a young age. I think there's been so much buzz about STEM. I, I realize we don't talk enough about STEM in our programming. We are like the pioneers of STEM in school gardens and outdoor education. So let's just be mindful of that. Don't leave us out of the picture when you're thinking about STEM projects. It's all happening in outdoor education all the time. Um, of course, there's tons of research showing the academic benefits of, of this engaged experiential learning model, especially when it's happening outdoors. Uh, there's health benefits, especially when that um, involves movement and, and you know, we, we do some gardening, so that gardening has a link to learning about nutrition. There's, we work with a and AgriLife closely, and they are actually doing surveys with our kids every year to find out how, um, what kind of nutritional impacts and outcomes our programming has. And behavioral benefits, I don't know who has raised sons or who grew up as a boy, not to be sexist, I was like this as a young girl too, so it could be a girl thing too. But kids do better after some movement, right? I mean, we all do, even us grown-ups. So if you can take kids who might be having a hard time in the classroom and incorporate movement throughout their day, they're gonna be really better off for it. They're gonna be able to come back and focus and maybe sit for a while and, um, and learn, be ready to learn. And the joy factor, we have, um, we have a motto, thanks to Elise, with Nacogdoches Naturally. We don't have a ton of rules in our after-school program. We have some guidelines. They're be safe, be kind, and be joyful. And if we can get those things right, we're gonna have, um, we're gonna have a lot of fun. So the joy factor is a really big piece of this. Learning should be fun. If it's not fun, we're doing it wrong. So the butterfly effect I threw on there just to kind of show y'all just talk to you about Alexa's story. She's been a student who I got to meet at the TJR School Garden program with, with the lemons. She um, is a joy. She has caught the garden bug really early on, was part of our after school program as well, and decided we had some plants to give away one of our years, and so decided with her dad that she wanted to build a garden at her house. So this is at her house. They took um, pallets and built just garden, um, a garden bed basically for free. I think they had to pay for the soil. And she did this herself. Her dad helped build the beds, but she really planted those plants, watered it, kept it going. I couldn't find an old text from her mom that showed me how her garden exploded, but it was literally exploding with kale. And the next picture was her holding um, a big bowl of the harvested kale and her mom saying, I don't think she came tonight. Okay, but I'm going to tell on her mom a little bit. She said, you know, Alexa's trying to tell me this is all kale and that we can cook it up. But she didn't believe her daughter. She's like, to get, to go ahead and tell me what this is so I can tell Alexa. I'm like, yes, ma'am, that is kale. And you can cook it up and you can make kale chips and they're high in vitamin C. They're great. Calcium, all good stuff. So she, um, she was able to teach that to her parents, right? And, and, and really... 
her garden is still going strong. I think it's gone through several seasons and you know it's looked all the different ways that gardens can look, but I'm really proud of this girl. She's awesome. She's also another advocate for outdoor education in school gardens. So she's gotten up in front of a couple different boards and our school board actually to talk about the benefits of school gardening. So she's real cool if you see her around town. And this I just wanted to show, I don't know if it'll play from here. Let's see. Um, this is just a little taste test, I like to call it, of our, of our school garden programs in the community. with an intern right now who is helping to put together another sort of short vignette of our outdoor ed programming here at the SFA campus. That was more of a, of a showcase of our different school garden programs around town. Um, and I wish that was done by tonight, but it's not, and that's okay, so um, next time. Um, we'll put that on our SFA Gardens Facebook page, so be looking out for that. 
Um, so let's see, outdoor education benefits the world. Yeah, so we've been talking about how this affects our students and our community. Um, when we, and I'll just say before we move into this, when we think about the benefits of, of, a, of a given student, that, that's really evident. But as an adult, as volunteers, as college mentors, um, we, it, it can just take the crummiest day you're having and turn it around and just, you leave joyful from, from volunteering in a garden space. Even if it's pulling weeds and you're not working with the kids, um, and when you're kind of working in community and you know you're serving, I feel like that's a really good thing to remember. Um, it helps us grown-ups too, so. And we get to learn right along with them. So we, um, we are creating lifelong stewards of the environment when we're, when we're teaching outdoor ed at a young age, even if we're not telling them, hey, you know what, you need to protect the environment because blah, 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 there's lots of reasons, right? But <clears throat> when we're just getting out into, our, into the outdoor spaces and enjoying them, we're teaching them appreciation of the outdoors, that's probably the very first step of creating that lifelong steward. If, if they don't know the outdoors exists, they don't care about it, they're not gonna wanna grow and protect it later on. So kind of we, we kind of see this first step of enjoying the outdoors, maybe learning about the outdoors, and, um, and growing into thinking about how are we gonna help protect the outdoors, um, these outdoor spaces, this wildlife, whatever, whatever their, um, you know, where their heart is, where they wanna put their energy into. We, um, we try, some years more than others, but in our after-school program, we try to think of ourselves as citizens and um, civic engaged little, little beings. So we might take votes. We try to foster this idea of democracy and thinking that, you know, we have, if we have a different idea of how the program might unfold or our station, maybe we don't like what we're doing, the activity we're doing. Um, we do encourage these students to maybe come up with a different suggestion and the, the groups can vote on that and see if they like um, if they like a different, a different idea that somebody might have. So, you know, in the school space, so much of it is so structured, there's not a lot of time and wherewithal to create these opportunities for kids to think of themselves as citizens, which I think is a really neat, uh, a neat part of, of this sort of more informal outdoor education. Um, we also, so much of, especially when I think of school gardens, there's, Inevitably, problems come up, and we need to be thinking on our feet and, and with each other and, um, you know, kind of in either peer-to-peer -peer or peer to, or um, kiddo to adult thinking of how to solve problems. And our world, for you know, we're entering in a really crazy world, so problem solvers are going to be very needed um, in our future. I mean, currently, right? We're seeing that now. So if we can cultivate these little problem solvers at an early age and be thinking about, oh wow, yeah, I wonder why you know, the spigot isn't turning on, or I wonder I'm not able to dig through that soil, this tool isn't working, and be thinking about what's the alternative, or what, how am I gonna troubleshoot this? Um, problem solvers, I think, is a really big one. So here at Nacogdoches Naturally, we have different levels of mentorship. Um, and this goes on to kind of think about this bigger butterfly effect. You know, we're working really closely with um, the same group of students. This is our weekly after school club program with the Boys and Girls Club. We work weekly, more than weekly, we, we meet with, other, with the college student counselors at least twice a week, um, but our kiddos will see weekly we get to develop really special relationships with these guys. They are learning, again, like we talked about, real life skills. We have, um, you know, real curriculum that they need to learn and implement and be ready to teach the other little kids that are coming into the program. Um, and we need, we have some of our kids as they start young, they'll stay in our program and they'll get to a point where, okay, sweetie, you know, you're, you're too old to keep coming but they really wanna come back, so we're, we're trying to think of them, some of them, as our junior counselors in training and be thinking about what pieces can they be um, either teaching or kind of mentoring to our younger kids. We have, um, and then in our broader um, 
I guess we don't work with ninth graders, but in our broader uh, family day programs or our summer camps, we work all the way from itty bitty to, to early high school. And that age range, sometimes we'll get to stay with those kids. We'll get to see them from, you know, all the way through. I haven't had the experience of getting to see that, but I know Carrie and Elise have. Um, and some of them, one student actually is really exciting. One student remembered way back when he went to a Piney Woods summer camp and he realized volunteering for us one summer that it was in fact this Piney Woods summer camp that he was volunteering and, and, and um, putting together our craft materials for. So um, I recruited him, of course, so now he's part of our after school club team. Um, so it's those kinds of connections that are really neat and he is definitely growing to be somebody who deeply cares about the environment and the outdoors and, and passing that on. So. Um, we have another really neat thing that I love about the programming that we do is we're not just environmental science students, we're not just biology students. We have a whole inter interdisciplinary crew of students that we work with every year, so it makes the programming really rich. It also makes, um, makes my job easier because I can say, hey, com computer science guy, help me figure this out or um, you know, somebody is the environmental science student and really has a passion for um, a certain activity that they've done, or a biology student and a lab idea. So there's lots of different pieces that I get to gain from the different types of students that we work with. We also are big fans of collaboration and community partnerships, so we get to really um, kind of fuse together different elements. Um, we get to benefit from the expertise in this community, which I'll talk more on in just a second. Um, and this year in particular, we're working with a Texas Parks and Wildlife um, grant that we're specifically targeting um, underserved different kiddos in the community, minority kids that are, um, don't necessarily have the opportunity to go on a big hike, a canoe adventure, camping. Um, so um, we get to teach a lot of those skills this year, which is exciting. And so I wanted to touch on that collaborative network and how, um, how important that is. If y'all are nerdy like I am, you might know about the mycorrhizal um, fungal network that is underneath the forest floor. It helps connect trees. Some people have called it, um, you know, it's kind of like the internet of the forest. It helps one tree species share resources with a completely different tree species depending on their surplus or their deficiency, which is amazing. They're not even the same tree species. They're, they can be completely different. Um, and I have a little video, if it'll work, let's see. Oh, I have to press play, that's right. Are, are you guys into this? You wanna learn for three minutes? Yeah, okay. Most of the forest lives in the shadow of the giants that make up the highest camp. These are the oldest trees, with hundreds of children and thousands of grandchildren. They check in with their neighbors, sharing food, supplies, and wisdom gained over their long life. They do all this rooted in place, unable to speak, reach out, or move around. The secret to their success lies under the forest floor, where vast root systems support the towering trunks above. Partnering with these roots are symbiotic fungi called mycorrhizae. These fungi have countless branches. A thread-like hyphae that together make up the mycelium. The mycelium spreads across a much larger area than the tree root system and connects the roots of different trees together. These connections form mycorrhizal networks. Through mycorrhizal networks, fungi can pass resources and signaling molecules between trees. We know the oldest trees have the largest mycorrhizal networks with the most connections to other trees, but these connections are incredibly complicated to trace. That's because there are about a hundred species of mycorrhizal fungi, and an individual tree might be colonized by dozens of different fungal organisms, each of which connects to a unique set of other trees, which in turn each have their own unique set of fungal associations. To get a sense of how substances flow
flow through this network, let's zoom in on sugars as they travel from a mature tree to a neighbouring seedling. Sugar's journey starts high above the ground, in the leaves of the tallest trees above the canopy. The leaves use the ample sunlight up there to create sugars through photosynthesis. This essential fuel then travels through the tree to the base of the trunk in the thick sap. From there, sugar flows down to the roots. Mycorrhizal fungi encounter the tips of the roots and either surround or penetrate the outer root cells, depending on the type of fungi. Fungi cannot produce sugars, though they need them for fuel, just like trees do. They can, however, collect nutrients from the soil much more efficiently than tree roots, and pass these nutrients into the tree roots. In general, substances flow from where they are more abundant to where they are less abundant, or from source to sink. That means that the sugars flow from the tree roots into the fungal hyphae. Once the sugars enter the fungus, they travel along the hyphae through pores between cells, or through special <coughs> hollow transporter hyphae. The fungus absorbs some of the sugars, but some travels on and enters the roots of a neighbouring tree, a seedling that grows in the shade and has less opportunity to photosynthesize sugars. But why does fungus transport resources from tree to tree? This is one of the mysteries of the mycorrhizal networks. It makes sense for fungus to exchange soil nutrients and sugar with the tree. Both parties benefit. The fungus likely benefits in less obvious ways from being part of a network between trees. The exact ways are totally clear. Maybe the fungus benefits from having connections with as many different trees as possible, and maximizing connections by shuttling molecules between trees. Or maybe plants reduce their contributions to fungi if the fungi don't facilitate exchanges between trees. Whatever the reasons, these fungi pass an incredible amount of information between trees. Through the mycorrhizae, trees can tell when nutrients or signaling molecules are coming from a member of their own species or not. They can even tell when information is coming from a close relative like a sibling or parent. Trees can also share information about events like drought or insect attacks through their fungal networks, causing their neighbors to increase production of protective enzymes in anticipation of threats. The forest health relies on these intricate communications and exchanges. With everything so deeply interconnected, what impacts one species is bound to impact others. So trees can sound the alarm during an emergency, but how exactly do they defend themselves? Check out this video for the mind-boggling answer. Okay, so you can do more geeking out at home. But, um, so I just love that analogy. I think that the, when a community is strong and resilient and networked together, really helps just benefit all the moving pieces in that community. Um, and I really see our school gardens as an example of this fungal network that's helping to kind of move and share resources along um, throughout, throughout many different paths. And I see SFA Gardens as a huge hub, like an old nurse, you know, a canopy tree who is helping to kind of facilitate learning and share resources and, um, you know, events like this that happen monthly, um, connecting people, creating community. I, I just, I love that. So I want to, oops, go on. I wanted to share that with y'all. Um, I have a little slideshow at the end if we have time, and I think we will. So. Um, I think I'll actually jump into that before. I just wanted to kind of be able to talk a little. Oh, it's going to be on. Let's see if I can pause it. Hey, Shannon. Do you want, can you come here, Shannon? Do you mind? You've seen all these pictures. It's not gonna let me click through. Do you mind clicking when I, when I ask you? Um, so this is at TJR. This is um, just sort of a really hands-on soil exploration. It's, we call it the FBI activity. Um, oh, is it wanting to go through? Okay, <laughs> human error this time. 
Um, and so we get to pick apart fungal bacteria and invertebrates in the soil, and it's super fun. This is Carrie and um, a student, Carrie Lemon at TJR Garden, helping to do um, a natural building, a, a natural fence called, I forget the style of fencing. What is it? A waddle, yeah. So, and they're using their mulberry prunings, so they're kind of using all these, the mulberry tree is right to the left of that photo. Um, so they're using all of these neat resources that the kids can learn, hey, this old stick isn't trash, you know, we're gonna go and learn how to use that again. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, Ann Tyndall is a wonderful volunteer in our community. She loves to bring her chickens out to not only our garden programs, but our family days. We have an annual bird day where we learn about birds. The chickens were a huge hit on that. Um, this, we have a, a wonderful nutrition game, and I just wanted to say that our nutrition department here at SFA has been really great, great students, great professors who help get linked into our school garden programs and teach nutrition um, to our kiddos. So there, it's the red light, yellow light, and green light, depending on what types of foods are healthy and going to make you feel good. So um, this, I think, is at one of our summer camps, and, um, but this is the same sort of prop that we'd have up for bird day, and we're really inspecting carefully what do different birds' nests look like. I just love how up and close and personal kids can get with our materials that we share. Again, another um, camp photo, but same thing with bird day. We, we love our birds, and we, um, we get to use real-life binoculars and teach those kids really how to use them. Uh, we have a lot of different insect viewers. I had a wonderful story that Mike, uh, Mike Moses shared with me about Carmen, one of our little campers and one of our after-school kiddos who's been coming to our program for, I think, four years, maybe. She's a sixth grader now in Mike's outdoor ed class, and she's been able to lead her friends, her little cohort of kiddos, on bug hunts. And they're not afraid of looking for the bugs in the soil. And because of her her modeling that this is okay and this is cool to be curious about these things, she just set the precedent for the class that that was going to be a cool, interesting thing to dive into. So I thought that was really cool. We do, this is at the Experimental Forest, we learn a lot about different wildlife. Here they're doing um, a competition to see which tracks match which animal. We like to gamify and, um, you know, healthy competition makes things fun for most kids, so we do a lot of that. Um, Sort of like eco art and natural building, this hands on, creative, unstructured um, time with nature is so fun, so fun. I encourage you all to go and do it because even for grown ups, super fun. Canoeing skills, we've, um, I personally got to start this job never having gone canoeing four years ago, and Jim and Carrie Lemon have been the greatest teachers um, in really helping um, so many generations of kids coming through learn how to be excellent canoers. They really teach. It's not just like, go out there and paddle. No, they're going to really show them the strokes, the J-strokes, and we'll really have, you know, like, just deep learning and a lot of fun doing these um, out at Lake Nakneach. Uh, we will invite our uh, Nacogdoches fire um, the firefighters have a venom response team. So Captain Cole, Ray Cole, will come out and share his snakes with us. Um, so that's his boa that he brings every time. And that is a wonderful snake. She's very friendly with us. So uh, again, with tracks and just showing how we kind of confuse art and all these different things together. Um, Fire building, this is at our teen camp. We kind of get into real life skills and this is at the end of the week after they've learned all these things and they do a big Olympics. So it's um, Team Awesome versus Team Fantastic or whatever and they go and they um, will have to get through all their different skills that they've learned that week. And, um, and this is out at one of our garden work days. We had families come together and volunteer and AgriLife was generous and loaned us their smoothie blender and um, their blender bike. And so they just literally will, you know, it blends it up just like it looks, it's, and it works, it's really cool. Um, and just a life tip with the smoothies, you can put spinach and it's delicious. You won't know it's even in there, especially with kids if they, I don't know if you like spinach, yeah, I'm seeing your face, but um, 
If you put a lot of blueberries in there and make it dark purple, you will, you will barely even know that it's in there just visually, and you won't taste it. Um, I don't know if you all have been um, to the Gala Mize Garden where we have our, our labyrinth, but this is a wonderful piece, a kind of a new addition to the gardens. Not so new anymore, I guess, but our students really love this day. We did some meditation that day and the little labyrinth walk, which was more of a sprint. They didn't really get that piece, but we did sit down and meditate in the middle of it, and that was fun. Uh, we partner with the community, so um, this event was happening at Festival Park. The library did the Nacogdoches Big Read, and they did a camp out overnight. A lot of these families, it was their first time camping out. These students, actually, for some of them, it was their first night camping out. Um, and you know, roasted community s'more, fire pit. It was a lot of fun. So um, that picture needs no explanation. Okay. Uh, this is another community event where we dressed up last year at Healthy Halloween as insects, and our whole station was all about the beneficial insects of, of our world and how we really actually need insects and need to appreciate them. So that was a really fun day. This is over in the Tucker Woods. Some of our, these are my two boys um, in action. You can tell that it's blurry. They don't stop moving. And that's actually Shannon, my assistant, her daughter, Moxie, who's, um, who gets to hang with us, too. And we have cooking programs, which um, a lot of times we're doing outdoor cooking. I think the weather was such that we were indoors that day. Um, and every twice a year, we'll do a big family feast. So our after-school program families are all invited to eat the food that their kiddos help make. So it's this huge, like, four, maybe five tables long of, of all these dishes that they've helped prepare with our um, student college counselors and nutrition students that come and help. And sometimes parents even come in to help out with the cooking, which was really fun that year. And they, by the way, those are, those are mixed greens. And guess what? Because they grew them, because they harvested them, because they cooked them, guess who's going to eat them? Really, truly, those kids are going to eat them, they're going to love them, and they're going to want seconds and be bummed, usually, that we ran out. So it's pretty amazing. This is Mallory, who's, who's here tonight. And so just really fun getting to, um, getting to help kids garden. We sometimes do eco art. So this is... Um, Eco art usually actually just happens in the in the so, you know on the ground, and we see it as sort of a temporal like it might be gone in five minutes, it might get blown away, and that's okay. We'll you know we'll try to take a picture of it, but it's just sort of like cap, you know capturing the moment of um, of eco art of art in nature. Anyways, they got to take that one home that day. Those are a few of our counselors and awesome kiddos excited to plant strawberries. We did food art that day, um, so they made all sorts of little creations out of all kinds of food. Um, this, is one, this is one of my older, my older son, Oliver, who's helping to plant potatoes in the garden, um, and that's over at Golden Gardens. And I think we're getting to the end. So this is um, Maggie and Bill Forbes, and they've, this day wasn't the compost learning community service learning day. Um, but they've done compost learning days in their garden before, so I threw that in, in there just to talk about how at these different sites we do service learning projects, and if you hear about those, you should come. They're really fun. You'll learn something, and we'll all kind of volunteer together. This day we were planting potatoes and putting in good compost into the soil, revamping the beds. Um, they got the kids from across the street to come in for the garden and help out. It was really fun. And that day was called Fitness in the Garden. And so we had um, somebody who teaches yoga come out and kind of learning about how to move in the garden, how to be moving gently and age well in the garden. And um, yeah, we got to do yoga outside together in the garden. It was very fun. Uh, of course, we had to harvest, and that was fun. Um, and then here's just a fun bonus. We get to do tea parties in the Azalea Garden every year for pr Little Princess Tea Parties. And they sound um, really fan. And so these are our counselors that helped out. And they are fancy and they are fun and a little over the top sometimes. But there's actually lots of learning that are happening throughout, um, throughout these two. So last year there was learning about monarch um, butterfly cycles, I think. Um, 
there was archery happening, so there was a Brave theme. Do you know, remember the movie Brave? So a lot of fun, a lot of empowerment, too. There's um, different elements, just sort of little magical elements that are spread through the garden, teaching girls that, you know, they, they are strong, brave women. Little women, little girls, so soon-to-be women. Um, and those are the little princesses in action. I think that's Tori's helping to lead them to the archery station, maybe. And uh, yeah, this is in our gardens back, tucked um, on the, over on that side. Elise was helping, um, I think she's Grandmother Spider in that picture, and she had just led them through a, um, an obstacle course where they had to collect their prey and come and, um, and take it over to their M Mama Spider. Am I remembering right? So. And uh, maybe we'll end on this one, but... Um, this is her group is sitting all around her, and I think we're doing animal charades. And so, you know, I see Cece here from theater, you know. So there's all these different elements where we're doing theater in the woods. Um, we do a lot of music. We, we've seen art. And then, of course, all the science. We do a lot of um, Texas standard-based environmental science that happens throughout uh, most of our programming, um, especially with field trips. So we do a lot. We, we stay busy. So thank you, I'll, I'll to put it back over. So we found the treasure, we're at the end. Um, I guess I've just been kind of re hearing what's going on in our world and thinking about um, there's been some um, the, I think I just talked to a friend who works for the BLM, her, her, the Bureau of Land Management, her budget is getting cut. I think there's, there's a need for people to really step up and honor and support this kind of education. It's becoming increasingly important that we have this kind of education, and, um, and we definitely need the support to do it. So I would just invite all of you sitting in this room, if you have you know, time on your hands, if you're part of a student organization that you, know, you have some influence and you can say, hey guys, let's get involved. Um, you can come and, and volunteer in any of our programmings. We teach field trips, we have the school gardens. There's lots of ways to get involved. Um, feel free to email me and I can help you get plugged in. Um, I think that there's maybe a donation made tonight by the volunteers, and thank you for these kinds of programs for the, um, for the lecture series. I think we just got a, a recent Garden Club donation, so donations are wonderful, and we really appreciate those. Um, it definitely takes money to run these programs. They don't all run on fairy dust, um, although you might believe it if Elise. <laughs> and we, we would love almost... As much as anything for y'all in this room to help us spread the word that these programs need support. Um, if you are sitting in this room and you might be on a board, you might, you might know other people who might be on the board, on different, on the school board, um, in the district, um, at SFA. School gardens, our environmental education programming, really, we can use support of all kinds in the form of staff, really. I mean, I'm gonna be honest, we can definitely use like real money with real staffing. So that is an ask that I'm just going to throw out there. Um, let it land wherever it does. And I would also say that I think a lot of you in this room are already our SFA Gardens. Um, you know, you're, you're part of our friend group and maybe on our board already and we really appreciate you. So we're so grateful. I'm glad you came tonight. Um, and yeah, so thank you. I think that, that that's about it, yeah.